We're delighted uh, to have you here tonight. Uh, tonight, Brad Hale, the director of the Nicaea Study Center, is here to um, teach us. Uh, Brad is right over there. Uh, I, want, I want to read to you the mission statement of the Nicaea Study Center. Uh, the Nicaea Study Center cultivates the good and abundant life in Colorado Springs by encouraging followers of Christ to love God with their minds as well as their strength, souls, and hearts through reflection on and engagement with the intellectual heritage of the historical Christian faith. It is a wonderful ministry that Brad is in charge of here. And um, you understand just from the time that Tim took us through St. Augustine what that intellectual heritage is like. How many of you have copies of Augustine's Confessions now? That's pretty good. Okay, the rest of you get with the program, okay? Um, another thing about uh, Brad, Brad is a retired emeritus uh, associate professor of history from Azusa Pacific. And I thought, well, I'd like to find a little bit more about Brad's time in California. So I went online. And I went to, oh, Brad, you're going to hate me for this. I went to rate my professor. Ooh, that's right. Ooh. And the reason I love Brad is because of a critical comment he got that if you take this class or this course, you will have to go to class. <laughs> he, he expects you to use critical thinking. And that's what we love about Brad, and you are going to be so blessed by his time tonight. So before Brad comes up, let's open with prayer, okay? Lord God, thank you for this time tonight. Thank you for the gifting and preparation uh, in Brad's life to bring him to this point. And so we pray that you will be with us tonight and that each one of us will learn something from you that we need to learn. And we pray this with great hope in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Junior, for that lovely introduction. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't visit, I never visited ratemyprofessor.com. Um, uh, our department secretary did at one point as she was reading my critiques uh, and just laughed as she went through. A lot of it was, you know, he's terrible, no, he's not. Yes, he is. You just think he's hard. No, I don't. And it's just really <laughs> quite a mess. But um, I, I, don't know, I don't know. Is this a humble brag if I say this? I don't know. You can all, you can all judge. But um, my, my, some of my students used to call me Dr. Fail uh, after Hale. So um, I wore it as a badge of honor, at least. Anyway, but no, thank you. Thank you, Junior, and, and uh, thank you, uh, Pastor Tim, for this opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I, I don't know about, about the rest of you, but I have really been blessed by Lent here at First Presbyterian Church. I mean, the sermon series on God's love in the Gospel of John, these, these wonderful uh, lectures on very lofty topics like love as the chief ethic or uh, love in, in, in Augustine and the rightly ordered loves and love and worship. And I, did anybody attend the recital on, on Sunday afternoon? I mean, the, the, the heavenly music that was presented to us, so just all these wonderful, exalted, uh, lofty things that we've, we've had. And here tonight, love and sex. So we've come down a little bit, uh, a little bit earthier, a little bit more lowly topic, but, but love and sex is an important topic, right? It is part of the human experience, a fundamental part of the human experience. A beautiful, enriching, but sometimes also vexing and perplexing part of the human experience. And if our loves are not rightly ordered, 
tragic and dangerous. We go from naked and unashamed to naked and ashamed. Solomon celebrated the marriage bed. I mean, he just had way too many wives. <laughs> Sex was a problem for the Corinthian church. What, what, what did we learn uh, during the Church on Purpose series? That to Corinth became a verb that had to do with sexual immorality. Um, and, and of course, we've heard recently that Augustine had uh, a little bit of trouble with sex in his conversion. He prayed, Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. <laughs> so, so it's important, and it's problematic. Now, I am not, like Reverend Dr. McGarrahan, I am not a reverend doctor. I'm a doctor, not one of the useful kinds. I'm a historian. Um, <laughs> but but I, I am not a theologian. I'm not a biblical scholar. I'm not a psychologist or a counselor or an anthropologist or a philosopher. It's a lot of things that I'm not. But I am a historian. That is my discipline. That is my method. And that is how I'm going to approach the topic tonight of love and sex. I'm going to break some rules for historians. Historians are not supposed to editorialize and say, hey, learn from this, and this is how we're applying it. We're not supposed to do that. I'm going to do that. Don't tell the historian's club. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to hopefully tell you when I'm doing that, but I make no promises. I, I sometimes get on a roll and just lose track of what I'm doing. Now, I chose the title, Love and Sex, in a time of crisis to give me a little bit of leeway in choosing a time to talk about. Now, it will come as no surprise to my friends and family that the particular time that I have chosen to talk about is 1968. It was a time of crisis. And here's just a small sampling of, what, of the things that made it a time of crisis. All of 1968 was overshadowed by the Vietnam War. It started with the Tet Offensive in January, and it just amped up from there. Angry, loud, sometimes violent student protests emerged across American college campuses. There were two political assassinations. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in April, and that sparked violent riots across the United States. And in June, Bobby Kennedy, a presidential candidate, was assassinated as well. And I don't think that caused riots as much as it caused despair. The Democratic and violent uh, uh, the chaotic and, and violent Democratic Convention in Chicago uh, took place. There was a police riot outside the convention hall, and there was violence and chaos in the convention hall. I'm just kind of rooting for another one of those conventions, I got to admit. But, you know, like when Dan Rather gets carried off in the middle of the convention. Um, sorry, that was, that was actually one of those free editorial things that I, I do. But, uh, so that was a mess. Overseas, in France, there was a violent near-revolution. The Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia, suppressing the Prague Spring. And I should probably also mention the global Hong Kong flu pandemic that killed somewhere between one and four million people worldwide. So I think it's fair to say that 1968 was a time of crisis. Not irredeemable, though. In December of 1968, the Apollo 8 lunar mission went up, orbited the moon, and brought back this photo, Earthrise. There was actually someone in 1968 who sent a telegram, telegram, <laughs> sent a telegram to NASA to say, thank you, you saved 1968. Now, 1968 was a time of crisis, um, very generally speaking, a time of crisis. But it was also a year when love and sex were in and of themselves a crisis. It is the time of the, or at least a, sexual revolution. It was a time uh, uh, when, when people started experimenting, exploring, and discounting uh, certain values and virtues that had come before. Tonight, what I want to think about is where the crisis of love and sex in 1968 came from, the nature of that crisis, and how Christians, 
especially evangelical Christians, responded to the crisis. Now, other Christians responded as well as, as evangelicals. Catholics had a lot to say in 1968. Uh, the Pope issued his encyclical, Humanae Vitae, on birth control, actually on life, but birth control was a big part of that. So I want to assure you, though, especially for those who, who might be a little bit nervous about a lecture on history, this is not merely going to be a history lesson. I do want to see how history can help us today. So with that in mind, I have two questions that I want you to think about during the talk for discussion at the tables at the end. I think they're on the handout. Um, I have vague recollections of putting that handout together, but um, hopefully they're there somewhere. But they should eventually be on the screen as well. So the first question is, what are the similarities and differences regarding the challenges to Christian beliefs and ethics about love and sex between 1968 and today? So are there similarities and differences that you, you pick up on during the course of my talk? Now, I'm going to give the game away. I think there are similarities. I think there are things that we can learn from. I believe that the preacher in Ecclesiastes knew what he was talking about when he told us that there's nothing new under the sun. Now, I wouldn't be talking about 1968 tonight if I didn't think there were things that we could learn and that there were similarities. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe today's sexual revolution is entirely unprecedented. But I think at least, Mark Twain once said, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes a lot. I think we can at least see some rhyming going on in history. So that's the first question. What are the similarities and differences? And the second question is, are there any lessons we can learn, whether positive or negative, from how Christians responded in 1968 to the sexual revolution? So by a positive lesson, I mean something like, ah, oh, they did that well. We should do that now. And of course, the negative lesson is, woo, that was a bad thing they did. I want to avoid doing that. So those are a couple of the questions I want us to be thinking about. Now, up front, I want to draw one parallel. In 2024, we appear to be on the cusp, if not in the midst, of a new sexual revolution. And Christians, especially young Christians today, are asking the same question about love and sex that many young Christians were asking in 1968. And here is that question, I hope. Knowing that love is the highest Christian law, considering all that we know now about sexuality, psychology, and biology, and considering the trajectory of our culture and society, should the church rethink and amend its beliefs and ethics regarding love and sex in order to better minister to our neighbors. Now, I didn't find that somewhere. I'm, I'm writing that on my own, but that is my sense, that young people then and now want to know why shouldn't we change? You know, I'm, I'm a Christian. I believe the Bible, but sometimes things need updating. We want to be relevant. In 1968, the big, question, uh, the big question was being asked about premarital sex. There were other issues when it came to love and sex, like the sexualization of culture, homosexuality, birth control, abortion, adultery, and divorce. But the issue of premarital sex dominated the conversation. Of course, there had been premarital sex before 1968. But usually there was a stigma attached to it. There was some kind of shame that went along with it. But in 1968, young people, including Christian young people, wondered whether there should be a stigma at all. And whether Christ the Christian and traditional prohibition on premarital sex was still valid and relevant, or whether it was simply outdated and irrelevant. As, as, a, as a brief aside, I, I have found out that the idea of being relevant was a big issue in 1968. Christians wanted to stay relevant. And I think, editorializing here, I think that got dangerous. Okay, my outline for the talk, which you should be able to find on your handout, um, I'm just going to talk about the first 
uh, first and the, the, the two big sections that I'm going to think about. First, I want to look at the sexual revolution of the 1960s, especially 1968, and how it challenged Christians regarding love and sex. So this will be the part on, on your handout that says love and sex in a time of crisis, love and sex as a crisis. Then we'll talk about how Christians responded to those challenges. So Christians respond, right? How they, challenge, uh, how they challenge, uh, answer those challenges and, and answer the questions about rethinking and amending our beliefs and ethics in regard to sex. So the first part, love and sex in a time of crisis and love and sex as a crisis. The first thing is out with the old, right? But first, a word from our sponsor. <laughs> Appeal. New Ultra Bright Toothpaste. The kickiest taste, the brightest teeth, the freshest breath. That spells sex appeal. New Ultra Bright gives your mouth <laughs> sex appeal. After Ultra Bright, everything else is just toothpaste. There you go. Um, now, that Ultra Bright commercial today seems pretty innocuous, kind of hokey. But for commentators in 1968, it was a symptom of the sexual revolution and a symptom of a sex-saturated culture. Sex was inescapable. It was everywhere. From the sexual innuendos on the TV hit show Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In to movies like Barbarella, from novels like John Updike's Couples to rock lyrics like the Rolling Stones' Let's Spend the Night Together, which my wife was surprised to find out that I knew about. <laughs> From Broadway, think about the musical Hair, to Madison Avenue and ultra-bright commercials, sex seemed ubiquitous. Not even Archie Comics could escape entirely as the miniskirt made its way into Veronica's wardrobe, as you can see here. I hope I'm keeping it PG. Donald Bastian, a Methodist minister, noted in an article for Christianity Today, everybody is talking about sex. Now, where did this come from, this revolution? It really seemed to come on uh, very quickly. People in 1968 almost seemed to be caught off guard by the sexual revolution as it, as it emerged in the late 60s. Now, one reason that emerged, it emerged when it did was technology. And by that, I mean the birth control pill. That was one part of the technological change. The FDA approved the birth control pill in 1960, so reliable birth control was made widely available through the decade. But also, there were improved treatments for venereal disease. It all meant less inhibition about unmarried sex. Vernon Grounds was a professor up at Denver Seminary. Now, in 1968, he was a professor at Conservative Baptist Theological Seminary in Denver, which I take to be Denver Seminary. Vernon Ground said this, modern science had removed the fangs of the venomous trio of terrors, detection, infection, and conception. You don't have to worry if you have premarital sex anymore. There are just fewer negative consequences. Prudential arguments don't hold. I don't think technology of itself and by itself can explain the revolution and the breakdown of the consensus that sex should be reserved for a husband and wife. The question of values was, was attached to a large, of values when it came to sex was attached to a larger and broader questioning of morals taking place among baby boomers, generally speaking. Now, I'm generalizing, okay? Historians do that. And then another historian comes along and says, aha, you forgot. But unprecedented prosperity, uh, baby, baby boomers grew up in unprecedented prosperity. Uh, and as they started to come of age, they started to question the values and morals and standards of previous generations. An obvious generation gap emerged and widened through the 1960s. Baby boomers believed that bourgeois values, whatever bourgeois was supposed to mean, 
that, that bourgeois virtues and morals had produced authoritarianism, two world wars, the Holocaust, nuclear war, the Cold War, and was bequeathing to them the Vietnam War and a society of racial segregation and injustice. That's a lot of responsibility to, to, to put on the previous generations. Many baby boomers developed a distrust of and a contempt for their parents' middle-class morality, which was poorly defined but easily mocked, as we will see, hopefully. We have a clip of The Graduate. Do we have it? There we go. I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, sir, you. Plastics. Exactly. How do you mean? There's a great future in plastics. Think about it. Will you think about it? Yes, I will. Enough said. That's a deal. The movie clip that defined a generation. Uh, the Graduate came out in December of 1967 and ran through 1968. It was a cultural phenomenon. And it really did define, I think, a lot of how baby boomers were feeling. It resonated with them. Especially, I think, that particular scene. Uh, ben is coming home from college. He's just graduated. He comes home to California. And he goes to his graduation party where everybody uh, is there except anybody his age. It's all his parents' friends, and they are wallowing in their prosperity, and someone pulls him aside and says, the future is plastics, something that is artificial, something that is phony, something that is fake. That is the future. Ben, of course, looks at this, and he believes his parents and his parents' generation is artificial, inauthentic, hypocritical, stale, boring, selfish, and alienating. More than that, the older generation had failed to live up to its own moral standards. Divorce in the pre-no-fault divorce era was on the rise. So that as one uh, uh, Presbyterian minister in New York City said, people were practicing serial polygamy. Or... As the, as the graduate demonstrated, adultery. Right? That's essentially what that movie is about, adultery. And this led to a generation that said, never trust anyone over 30. <laughs> Baby boomers were questioning the entire moral framework of previous generations. The sexual ethic was a part of that. So, out with the old. But what about the new? In 1968, a journalist by the name of Vance Packard published a book called The Sexual Wilderness. He actually argued there was no sexual revolution. For him, a revolution implied out with the old and we've got something to replace it. And Packard said there's nothing here replacing it. We're simply in a wilderness, wandering around, lost and confused. There are no new guiding principles for the relationship between the sexes or for sexual ethics, generally speaking. Newsweek magazine said that the old taboos were dead or dying. What is there that's going to guide us? Some people hoped that a new morality could be discovered. It's a strange idea that you discover a whole new morality. Now, there were two candidates that, that a lot of Christians in particular mentioned that were vying to be the new guiding principle. The first was the Playboy philosophy. I like to show a lot of images in my PowerPoints. I decided that was not a good idea tonight. <laughs> uh, Hugh Hefner started Playboy magazine in 1953. In 1963, a decade later, as things are picking up, he published something called the Playboy philosophy, trying to elevate his enterprise to the level of philosophy. Playboy was really increasing its influence. In 1967, it saw a 28% increase in its circulation, and ad revenues went up 19%. Lillian Dean wrote an article for the Christian Herald in 1968 about Playboy magazine and said, 
You might not like it, but it can't be ignored. Not only was its circulation increasing, but she noted that Christians, including Christians at Christian colleges and Christian ministers, were reading it. You had to take it seriously. Liberal clergy were participating in Playboy forums and hobnobbing at the Playboy Mansion outside of Chicago. So it was important. A professor of theology at Lancaster Semin Seminary summed up the Playboy philosophy this way. Sex is for fun. It's good recreation. It's play. A real man needs his collection of playmates. Now, some defenders of the Playboy philosophy said that sex is more meaningful if it's an expression of love. It's a nice concession. But it can be an end in itself. It's better to have loveless sex than no sex at all. In some respects, anticipating some of the things we might hear today, the Playboy philosophy was also saying that you are your sexuality. Now, many critics, outside as well as inside the church, agreed that play, the Playboy philosophy was nothing more than old-fashioned hedonism. Right? And actually, young people rejected this. Some rejected this, too. I think, actually, that's part of the theme of The Graduate. The, the adults are the hedonists, and the, the character of Ben is looking for something more meaningful. Now, he has meaningless sex, but he's looking for something that is more meaningful. Critics also said that it's simply an exploitive philosophy. The girl emerges as a kind of accessory. Depending on the fashions, depending on the season, you can exchange her for something else. So that was one option, the playboy philosophy. There was also a new morality that was called, well, the new morality. Um, it was also called situation ethics which was a little bit more of a serious attempt, not just marketing like Hugh Hefner, to find a new guiding principle for morals. Joseph Fletcher wrote a book called Situation Ethics in 1966. And he said the real question of ethics is, is love fully served? Love was the only ethical absolute, and love guides all ethical choices. The new moralist said that uh, it was that the new morality was person-centered as opposed to principle-centered. What that means is you ask, does this help my fellow human being? Does this choice express love? The principle-centered is things like, you know, the Ten Commandments. We don't want to follow those. We don't want to be bound by those simple formulas or codes of ethics. Ethical decisions should be made based on context and situations, as long as people were exercising responsibility. Now, I have a lot of problems with this, but I don't have time to go into it. We'll go into that maybe a little bit later. I think, though, that, that this new morality was summed up by some graffiti uh, that appeared in the, uh, during the French Revolution of May 1968. Uh, the, the revolutionaries in 1968 uh, uh, took to the streets, they, threw, they tossed cars over, and rather than writing a manifesto, they came up with clever slogans that they just sprayed on the walls. Things like, all power to the imagination, whatever that's supposed to mean. I think my favorite one was, I am a Groucho Marxist. That, that I can get behind. <laughs> but but this, this slogan was, it is forbidden to forbid. That was the new morality. Ironic, but that really expresses the idea of the new morality. Don't forbid. There are no absolutes except for love. I suppose it might also be summed up in the, the brilliant philosophy of the rascals in their hit song, People Got to Be Free. All the world over, so easy to see. People everywhere just want to be free. Also from 1968. Now, the implications for, the sexual, uh, for sexual ethics in that kind of new morality are pretty clear. No formulas, no prohibitions means no thou shalt nots. 
One religion professor said that any formula like yes if married, no if not, just seemed silly. The new moralists asserted that there might be times and circumstances when premarital, extramarital, or postmarital relations are not only permissible, but desirable. In fact, some situationists and new moralists argued that there were situations when premarital sex may be far more ethical than a legalistic chastity. Take, for example, Franco Zeffirelli's 1968 film adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. It's about pure love. I just want to say oh. one. I do love that clip. <laughs> Romeo and Juliet was about pure love, unencumbered by tradition, unencumbered by the family feuds and the social constraints. Love is love and needs to be acted on. Now, somewhat ironically, Olivia Hussey, who played uh, Juliet, who was 15, and Leonard Whiting, who was 16, are now suing Paramount Studios for child abuse, for pressing them as, as minors into a love scene. And of course, we also know that Romeo and Juliet goes pretty wrong at the end. If you didn't know that, I'm sorry. I mean, spoiler, but you know, there it is, right? Um, now, getting ahead of myself here, there was a Christian response to the new morality, a man by the name of Orville S. Walters. Um, nobody really names their kids Orville anymore. It's a shame. But um, uh, Walters wrote that in, in Christianity Today that when love is pried out of its scriptural context and left to cope with the caprice of specious logic, it can lead to self-deception, which I think actually is the theme of Romeo and Juliet. They have deceived themselves and lost the context of morality. Now, young Christians in 1968, especially college and university students, were immersed in the new morality. It was a philosophy that was all around them. It was even being supported by some prominent clergy, uh, such as an Anglican bishop, J.A.T. Robinson, who later became a dean at Cambridge University. He said that love is the sole Christian law. That's it. You can exchange codes of conduct for mature love thy neighbor as thyself methods of ethical decision making. So the logic of the new morality that college students are hearing leads to throwing out constraints. Joseph Fletcher, who wrote the situ uh, situation ethics, had no problem with the idea of premarital sex, adultery, or homosexuality, as long as love rules the day. Letha Scanzoni, a Christian, wrote a book called Sex and the Single Eye, geared for young people facing big questions. And she noted how much the, the new morality was affecting young people's thinking. She said uh, that a couple in love wanted to know why it was wrong if they were simply expressing mutual desire uh, in, in having sex. They didn't hurt anybody, they weren't exploiting anyone. That was the big question being talked about on college campuses. And Scanzoni notes, even among young people from evangelical backgrounds. Young Christians in 1968 questioned whether the church's traditional teaching that outside the bonds of marriage, uh, sex is always wrong. Right? They question that idea. Is it always wrong? Now, Christian authors frequently shared anecdotes about young people uh, with problems and questions about sex before marriage. Here is Vernon Ground sharing one of his stories. Marriage seems out of the question for now. She's a nurse and the sole support of her mother, or of her widowed mother. He's a med student with at least three more years of training. His parents are unyieldingly op opposed to the marriage until after his education is complete. They love each other. As Christians, they're persuaded that God intends her for him and him for her. In their thinking, they're already irrevocably united. Nothing but death can break the bond between them. No wedding, however solemn and legal, could deepen their relationship, but would only be a public repetition of the vows they'd privately exchanged. 
Since they're publicly engaged, why should they hesitate to express their love sexually? In view of their total commitment, what is wrong with complete and ultimate intimacy? For sex for them will be a relationship of love, a deep and exclusive love. Sex will even be an expression of covenantal love. For in, they, for in love, they covenanted to belong to each other until death separates them. The possibility of unwanted pregnancy is virtually zero. The hazard of scandal can easily be circumvented. Then why not? Even if they're not husband and wife yet, with such a set of circumstances, is premarital sex still taboo? So here we come back around to the question that unites 2024 and 1968. If love is the sole Christian law, and if sex is an expression of love, and if reason guides moral decision making, then why not? Which brings us to at least some Christians' response to the sexual revolution. The first thing that should be said about Christians responding to the sexual revolution and this big question is that Christians responded to the sexual revolution and this big question. They didn't ignore it, and they didn't evade it, they didn't run and hide. And I think there is a lesson here. Now, not every Christian or every evangelical responded, but there were a lot of publications with different audiences that tried to give answers to the pressing questions on love and sex in 1968. Books like Letha Scanzoni's Sex and the Single Eye. Vernon Grounds wrote a four-part series for his magazine, which was the magazine of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. So it was geared toward answering Christian college students' questions about sex. Now, my favorite title was The Stork is Dead. I, I don't know really what that was supposed to mean, but it's a good title. In addition to simply answering there was a sincere, and re sincere, real effort to engage the questions thoughtfully and cogently. Quoting from Letha Scanzoni, pat answers, pious cliches, angry retorts, changing the subject, dodging the issues, or pretending not to hear the questions are cowardly ways of handling such queries. Christian integrity demands that we face up to the problem as frankly as possible and with utmost honesty. Vernon Ground said that church leaders needed to admit that sheer authoritarianism is not likely to prove helpful. To quote one text or a dozen from scripture is usually as effective as trying to stop a tank with a pea shooter. So these Christians set out to avoid preachiness, scolding, reductionism, and oversimplifying. They wanted to give the reasons behind the morality to provide the why. In a sense, they wanted to provide a theology of love, sex, and marriage. On the substance, the first part of the response was, sex is a good gift from God. This may seem obvious, but as Christian authors noted, it really wasn't, at least not in Christian circles in 1968. The view from 1968 was that while there were times in church history when Christians were more favorable towards sex, on balance, through history, Christians really did not think highly of sex, and at best believed that sex was a necessary evil or an embarrassment. Too much bad Greek philosophy, that kind that alleged that matter was evil and therefore the body was evil uh, and held to be in contempt had shaped the thinking of too many patristics and too many ascetics in church history. And as a result, Christianity had been far too body debasing, pleasure denying, and eros denigrating. One author in 1968 suggested that Augustine wished that God had planned some other means for human reproduction than intercourse. You can double check with Pastor Tim on that one. <laughs> Get out your City of God, uh, book 14, just, to, just a, as a quick reference. Again, with Vernon Grounds, he wrote that Christian sexophobia, 
a prudish asceticism that holds the body and its functions in contempt, a perverted spirituality that looks down on sex as sinful as a sinful necessity, unclean, defiling, and evil is heresy. He lamented that, unfortunately, that chapter in Christian history had not yet been concluded. He even told a story of a Presbyterian minister who had been married for 15 years before learning that he had the right to enjoy sex, and of a pastor's wife who said that her parishioners would be horrified if they knew that she and her husband found pleasure in sex. This was in 1968. So the emphasis on the goodness of sex, sex as a gift from God, was a necessary corrective. Sex was not only God's idea, but God's ideal. Looking to the Bible, ah, yes, the Bible, right? Good place to go. Vernon Ground said that the warped negativism about sex cannot be blamed on Scripture. He said that instead, the Bible provided positive affirmation and unblushing sanction of sex as a God-created blessing, a joy, a delight. A number of authors in 1968 pointed to the Song of Solomon. That makes some sense. Although through much of history, church leaders had tried to explain the poem away as pure allegory. In 1968, the argument was being made Song of Solomon is not just an allegory of God's love for his people. It might be an allegory of God's love for his people, but it's not just an allegory of God's love for his people. Ground said that Christians needed to embrace the Song of Solomon's erotic frankness and realism, an unabashed exaltation of loving sensualism. Authors in 1968 believed that a biblical book about love and sex might actually be about love and sex. In short, Christian thinkers in 1968 argued that it was actually okay to enjoy sex and that sex was a gift of God to be enjoyed. They did caution against sex becoming an idol. Sex outside of marriage, they argued, could more easily become an idol than within, It was less likely to become an idol and more likely to be viewed in perspective when it is thus seen as only one part of an overall relationship, marriage, and a demanding relationship at that. Which brings me to the search for meaning, the relationship of marriage, and the meaning of sex and marriage. So from the view of 1968, the reasons behind the regulations demonstrate that they're not merely regulations. That that what these regulations that God had put in place in the Bible were meant to protect a good. If there's a prohibition in scripture, it usually is trying to protect something that is good. And in this case, it is the marriage. So the meaning of marriage and sex for the husband and wife starts with the idea that God instituted marriage as a unique means of companionship. It is not good for man to be alone. Authors noted this was the first reason for marriage. Not procreation, but companionship. It is not good for man to be alone. Sex within marriage provided a unique, unparalleled, incomparable opportunity for intimacy between husband and wife, man and woman. The idea of one flesh has a profound meaning behind it. First in Genesis, I note that that in Genesis, the author stops very briefly and says, for this reason, right? It's the first biblical commentary. For this reason, a man shall leave his parents and cleave to his wife. So Genesis affirms the idea of one flesh, and Jesus affirms the idea of one flesh. It's worth pointing out that Jesus' teaching about marriage did not start with what marriage had become. That's where the Pharisees were. The Pharisees focused on how marriage had evolved over time. Jesus went back to what God intended at the beginning. And in the Hebrew, 
I'm not a Hebrew scholar, I confess. But in Hebrew, the idea of one flesh stood for the whole of man's mortal life, his feelings, his aspirations, his strengths, his weaknesses, the merging of two persons, not just two bodies. Marriage provided security as well. And part of that security came from publicly entering into a covenant. Letha Scanzoni pointed out that marriage is not just about man, woman. It is about man, woman, God, and society. There's a reason for a public declaration. The marriage, husband and wife, also is redemptive and sanctifying. We'll come back to this shortly, but it does tell us something about redemption. Marriage was for procreation. They did get around to that eventually. All of these reasons were wrapped up together. The meaning of marriage in regard to the triune God is also to think, important to think about. These arguments actually from 1968 helped me a lot in answering the question, of whether or not anything about the Christian ethic on love and sex should change. Marriage, as ordained by Scripture, and as Jesus said, it was intended at creation, one man, one woman, in a loving, lifetime, exclusive, secure, devoted, trusting, intimate relationship that is publicly declared and affirmed, tells us something about who God is in particular about unity and plurality or plurality and unity. Man and woman were created together to reflect God's image. The difference between Adam and Eve, male and female, matters. Again, Donald Bastian. Adam recognized Eve's likeness and similarity as well as the differences and noted that she was his other half because of the differences. Vernon Grounds wrote, the Bible asserts that the male-female bisexuality, today I think he would not use that word, I think he would use the male-female binary, mirrors the nature of the deity. Theologian Peter de Jong wrote, the plurality of the life of, male, of man, male-female, is a reflection of the plurality of the life of God, that is, the Trinity. Vernon Ground summed up this idea. Man and woman, in their togetherness, and particularly husband and wife, in their union with each other, reflect the ways in which God is and reveals himself. To the Christian church, the sexual differentiation and togetherness of man and woman can be the image of the differentiation as well as the bond between God the Father and God the Son as they are united through the Holy Spirit. Here's some editorializing. If the triune God is unchanging and he's given us marriage, at least in part, as an analogy to teach us something about who he is, what happens when we start changing the analogy? Isn't that a form of idolatry? Okay, back to the 1968 stuff. The meaning in regard to Christ and his bride. Biblical marriage tells us something about Christ's relationship with his people. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32. We get the sense, <clears throat> hoping it's coming up. In Ephesians 5, 32, we again get the idea of one flesh. Paul also writes, this is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. He is giving instruction about marriage, but he says what's important about this is that you understand that this is about Christ and his church. Your marriage tells the world something about Christ and his bride. Marriage illustrates Christ's redemptive sacrifice and his union with his bride and our union with him. It represents a new covenant. Again, my editorializing. We are not at liberty to change the analogy. If marriage tells us something about God and something about Christ's relationship with the church, 
we can see that marriage, as intended in Genesis and affirmed by Jesus, is a good to be protected. There's a Latin phrase, corruptio optimi pessima. The corruption of the best is the worst. What happens if we corrupt the best and change what God intended? In 1968, Christian thinkers concluded that marriage safeguards the richness of sex, the richness of love, the richness of marriage for the sake of the people involved, the husband and wife, and also for the sake of the gospel. That last part I find personally challenging. I wonder whether or not the world can read the gospel in my marriage. Thank you. All righty then. I don't think you all were interested in this at all. I can tell by the sheer silence at your tables. Uh, before we begin our Q&A, Brad just wants to say something about the Nicaea Study Center. Yes. So uh, you, have, you might hopefully have a brochure somewhere. Um, and thank you, uh, Junior, for uh, reading off the mission statement. The, hopefully things will be explained pretty much in the, the brochure. But I just wanted to call your attention to the logo on the front, the lamp on the book. Uh, one way to think about the Nicaea Study Center, uh, in, in terms of bringing Christian thinking to the secular college and university campuses in town, is to think about we, what we want to help Christian students and faculty do is, is to think about everything in the light of the gospel. So it's sort of like the C.S. Lewis idea of uh, I believe in Christianity as I believe in the sun, not just because I see the sun, but because by it I see everything else. So we want, we want Christian students, Christian faculty to be able to think about what it means to be a Christian literary scholar, uh, history major, philosopher, nurse, marketer. We want to bring the best of Christian thinking, the best experiences of a Christian college or university to UCCS or Colorado College or the Air Force Academy. Right? They're not getting some of that training that you might get at a Christian college. We want to bring it to them. That's what the Nicaea Study Center is about. So uh, enjoy the brochure. Just before bed, you can fall asleep to it if you... And now okay, questions. I know, I heard you. <laughs> Jim, you, you've been nominated. Finally. <laughs> you're looking at someone who lived in 68, and you're looking at someone who lived in 24. <laughs> so as to the first question, the differences that I see having gone through that new morality, that sexual revolution in the 60s, late 60s, uh, and the ones that we see now, what's your, what's your view of the difference? Because in 60s, it was almost always men and women. Mm -hmm. And now it has drastically changed to a whole new one. Now we're seeing yeah. Romans 1 and 2. Right. What's your response to that kind of a difference in observation, having not seen the one in 68? No, I was, al yeah, I was alive in 68. Um, I, have, I have no memories of 1968, but I was alive in 1968. Um, yeah, the, part of the way I think about it is, I guess I think about it in two ways. You know, one is that what, what you see happening in 1968 with the sexual revolution uh, is, is the unleashing of ideas and forces that once you start saying these are the ultimate things, love is love, right? Love is the absolute ethic, doesn't have to be constrained by anything and shouldn't be constrained, that absolute freedom is the most important thing. You sort of let uh, a genie out of the bottle and you can't get it back in. I think that's, that's one thing that, that I see in terms of the, where 68 leads. Um, you know, and you start thinking about, it's not, it's not too long after, it's, it's 1969 that uh, California enacts the first no-fault divorce law. Uh, in the early 1970s, you start to see gay activism pushed much, much more to the forefront. 
Um, so it's not too long after that, and then it just keeps rolling and picking up steam. I think in a lot of ways, it's also, the, the second way I, I look at it, it's, it's a difference of degree, not necessarily kind entirely, right? So we're still looking at, if God has ordained marriage to be a particular thing and for a particular purpose, we don't mess with that. That's what it is. If this is what God has said about sexuality, that's what is true. And people are still poking at that and saying that can't be true because I don't want it to be true. And so it's, that's the same. The degree uh, is very different, uh, not just in terms of uh, veering away from just man and woman, right, but also to saying, well, today I'm a man and tomorrow I'm a woman, right? The, the questions of, of, you know, I can, I can determine whatever I feel inside. Uh, but that tracks back to the Playboy philosophy, goes back further too, Carl Truman would talk about this, but like the Playboy philosophy of I am my sexuality, right? So whatever I feel inside, that's who I am, as opposed to, well, I'm, I'm a lot of things, you know? Sexuality is, is a part of who I am, but it's not the whole picture. So does that more or less answer your question? Less than more? <laughs> okay. I am Wolfgang. So if 1968, where I was in Germany, was the beginning of a revolution, a sexual revolution, I lived through the air musical, I lived through the Vietnam uh, protests in Germany, in Munich, and all that kind of stuff, it went by me. And I don't understand really why, and I doubt, actually, based on that, that we had a sexual revolution. <laughs> Because if we had one, yeah. I would like to ask the Christians around here, how come that today, for our kids, for our, my sons, I have no better story, absent of your partial dissertation there, to which they wouldn't listen, to tell them why they should mm -hmm. not have premarital sex? How come over almost 60 years of my time, nothing better has come up? as a good way of talking to the kids. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that question in two parts. Okay. So we are still struggling to answer these questions, you know, the questions that they come up with. I think part of that is still, uh, the topic of sex is still embarrassing to people, right? I mean, it's just, it's, it's everywhere. Right? I mean, it's more available than it was in 1968. It's, our culture is more sexualized in so many ways. And we're still really bad at talking about it as a, as a culture, generally speaking. It, it's, it tends to be a joke uh, if, if we address it. Um, and I think that's, that's hopefully what I'm challenging us to do is to be able to also have some good answers. To start, and there are other answers that we can have. There's a lot of good resources. Um, Christopher West uh, Sam Albury, uh, Christopher Yuan, some good authors to look at, Rebecca McLaughlin, Rachel Gilson goes on and on, but, right, to help us to have good answers. But, but what I wanted to kind of lay out tonight and the thinking in 1968 from Christians was to say, what is the good, right? What is it that God is protecting by the prohibitions? Um, and so I think that's a good place to start to say, I know what marriage is and marriage is good. Right? I know what sex is, and I know that sex is a gift from God, and, and God gives good gifts. So that's a good place to start. You know, hopefully we can continue to have those conversations, and, and there will be more resources. I think there are Christians who are talking about this, writing about it, uh, so there are things there. Um, something came across my email, uh, I think from the Gospel Coalition, that Sam Albury and Rebecca McLaughlin are supposed to be doing some sort of seminar or it's a cohort for the Keller Center for Cultural Apologetics, and they're gonna do some, some kind of seminar on sexuality, right? So Christians are addressing it, but just we don't necessarily wanna talk about it a lot because it's still embarrassing. But I think that's, that might be the part of your, an answer to part of your question. Yeah, and, and hopefully they, it starts making its way down. I think, um, I mean, I, you know, I joked at the beginning, I don't know if people thought it was a funny joke, but it was a joke at the beginning when I said, we had these lofty topics, you know, on the Christian ethic and love and worship. 
and we're coming down. But, but it, it is important to talk about, right, and to think about. Um, I, I was challenged in doing the, the preparation for this. So, yeah, it, it should come down out of the ivory tower. Um, the second part about, you know, 1968, just, you know, going past. Um, I taught a class at Azusa Pacific University on 1968. So one semester, one year. Uh, and for the students, it seemed very, very far away. Um, which, you know... When, when I would ask the students toward the end of my time there, you're like, what do, does anybody remember 9-11? No. Oh, you know. Um, but uh, I would ask them to do an oral history. So go find someone who was at least 18 years old in 1968, ask them questions, get a story, find out what they were doing, and then come back. And the students thought for sure that everybody that they were going to talk to was involved in a protest or had been in Vietnam or had done something radical. And more than often than not, people would say oh, I was working at a factory and had to work from six in the morning until six at night. That's pretty much all I remember, or, right? Or um, uh, one student, it was interesting, she was white, but her grandmother was African-American, and she said to her, she was trying to talk to her grandmother, she's like, well, what about the Martin Luther King assassination? Didn't that, you know, she's like, well, it was sad, but I had to get the kids to school and get to my job and put food on the table. What do you want me to say? For most people, 1968 was that. Uh, th there were headlines. There were a lot of people grabbing headlines. It's kind of like today. A, a small minority of voices gets a lot of attention. So I think it's, it's true then, too. So. That, that's one way. <laughs> okay. You partially answered my question by listing off the names of all those people um, that are talking about it, but I don't remember 68 anyone talking about the alternative to the sexual revolution. But now, what should pastors and churches be talking about the cultural changes that we're going to? Because we don't hear... Christian voices anywhere else that are talking about it. Right. Um, I mean, it's a strange world that we live in. There are more and more resources available, that, but that in some ways makes it less and less easy to get to them because uh, there's just so much you don't know where to, to look. Um, so, I mean, I think the pastor should start with the Bible, right? Um, I don't think pastors, I mean, I'm not telling the pastoral staff at First Pres what to do, right? Um, and bear in mind, too, uh, when, when, when I sat down with Junior and she asked me to give this talk, um, she, <laughs> I'm going to, uh, she said that she and Pastor Tim, so I'm blaming him too, wanted me to talk about love and sex. And... Um, I think, like, I, I, oh, what a wonderful invitation to give a Lenten lecture. And then she told me the topic, love and sex. And I think I kept a reasonably calm face. But I, in my head, this little noise started, started going off. Um, so, so I would just say like, the pastoral staff here is concerned about it. right? So that, that is, that's a good thing. Um, there could be classes. There could be teaching. Um, you could find resources. Some of the names that I mentioned, I'll, I'll go through some of them again, just in case I went through them too fast. Sam Albury, Rebecca McLaughlin, Wesley Hill. Wesley Hill, Christopher West, uh, Christopher Yuan, Y-U-A-N. Um, I mean, an interesting take on this, I'm going to, uh, Jackie Hill Perry, I'm looking to my wife just to see if she would nod and say, yeah, okay, she, that's all right, but not a great one. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so th those are good resources. Uh, maybe, you know, taking one of those books and reading it with, with one another, you know, finding a class together, um, reading it in a home together. Um, you know, I think it's good if pastors do a series. 
Um, you know, it is in the Bible. Uh, I did, um, I would do Bible studies with APU students, and the first year we did Genesis, and I let them choose the, the next book, which I realized is a little dangerous, and they actually wanted to do Revelation. Um, <laughs> And we went back and forth, but after a couple of times giving them choices, I said, look, pick any book, but I will not do Song of Solomon with you. Um, but a series on Song of Solomon, right, could be a great sermon series. Um, uh, and just, uh, Philip Riken is the president of Wheaton College, and he would do chapel. Um, and he did a, a chapel series on Song of Solomon. And his daughter was in the, the audience, it was a student at Wheaton. And after the first session on Song of Solomon, and he was talking about Song of Solomon is about sex as well as love. And the students came out and one of the daughter's friends looked and said, wow, that was awkward. And she said, awkward for you, it was my dad, right? <laughs> um, but I think, you know, I, I think, you know, studying these, I don't, I don't, rec I don't recall a whole lot of, Bible studies or sermon series on Song of Solomon in my experience, you know. You can get, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that, that pops up, but it's just one chapter, you can avoid it, you know. Um, so is, am, am I answering your question or am I, okay, so. One over here. Yeah. When you talk about a revolution in 1968, I was there on college at that time. <laughs> But what I'm wondering if the revolution isn't so much a behavioral change or really that the behavior is just people talk more about it, not that the activities or the behavior is any different from what it's been. He who forgets history is doomed to relive it. Yeah. Um, as they, they would, students in my classes would say, he who doesn't remember, remember history is doomed to repeat this course. Um, <laughs> True. No, I, I, think that's, I think that's true. I think, and I actually think you see it today, there's a certain romanticism that comes with revolution. So people are looking for a revolution. They may not have cause for it, but they think, what a wonderful thing to be a revolutionary. And they forget that revolutions tend to cause a lot of death and destruction. Um, yeah, a lot of revolution is talk. Um, but I think, I think, I don't think that's unimportant in some ways. Uh, there are actually surveys that were done in 1968 asking college students who were talking about a sexual revolution, well, what are you doing? You know, what are your sexual behaviors? And they said, well, I'm waiting until marriage. And there was actually a lot of students who were holding to traditional values. But they were saying, but why? Why am I doing that? You know, what's the point? What's holding me to that? And the revolution in some ways was to say there's no reason for it. And it's only if you can ground it in, I think if you can ground it in biblical teaching, then you have something solid. So yeah, a lot of revolution is, is just talk. Um, so still potentially dangerous, but a lot of it's talk. Yeah. How much of it, I'm gonna ask a question. Can't, can't carry this. How much of it, as you we're talking about the revolution, is nothing more than the tyranny of the novel. Tyranny of the? Novel. And I don't mean the literary work. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna go all historian on you. It depends on the revolution. Um, I think a lot of the, the revolution of 1968 and in, in a lot of ways, I think the 1968 was a, was a bunch of failed revolutions. Um, but I think a lot of the revolution in 1968 was um, caused by a kind of malaise, you know, dissatisfaction. I don't, you know, life isn't as fun as I think it should be. So uh, the revolution in France, for example, you know, college students are out and, you know, a slogan like all power to the imagination, what do you hope to accomplish with that, right? But I think it was, so there, uh, uh, during the Middle Ages, they would have carnival, right? And part of carnival is just like letting off steam. And so you have a week 
and you can go crazy, and you can make fun of authority, and then you have to put it back in the bottle for, for the rest of the year. I think that's somewhat what you saw at, in France, at Columbia University. Uh, there was a big takeover of the, the administrative buildings as well. Some revolutions, I think, were sincere. I think the Prague Spring, which was pushing back against communism, was sincere, but then it was crushed. Uh, there, was, there were actually student protests in Mexico City against authoritarianism, actually for a real cause of political liberty in 1968. Um, and those students were just, uh, just gunned down. Um, so, you know, like, that's, you know, if you're, if you're risking your life, you know, to say we want actual, genuine freedom, that's, that's less the tyranny of the novel. But in a lot of Western countries like the United States, France, Germany, England, Italy, yeah, a lot of it was, you know, we're bored, we want to do something different. They didn't have Netflix. I've been given a signal this is our last question. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. I wonder, in the 60s, the way the church responded well to the sexual revolution, if they got any traction out of digging into what we even mean when we're talking about love. Love is an English word that gets yeah. sort of um, recycled for referring to a lot of things. So I love Chick-fil-A. <laughs> um, I love naps. I love my dog but there are very few ways that I use the word love in a way that corresponds to sex being an expression of that love. Yeah. And it, to me, that seems common. We talk about things we love all the time. Is there any strategic advantage or strategic traction that the church had in 1968 with, with pushing into that issue? What do you even mean by love that we could borrow from? Yeah. I, I mean, the short answer to the question is, I don't know. I haven't really seen much of that. Um, certainly, there are references things like agape love. Um, I mean, I was looking more at things like the, the eros kind of love. Um, there are some mentions of C.S. Lewis and the Four Loves, but not a lot. Um, I, I do think it's helpful to be able to, to talk about different kinds of love. Um, English is a wonderfully adaptive language, so, you know, maybe, um, you know, here in this group we can start a, a, a linguistic revolution and start going around and saying things like, you know, I phileo you, or, you know, I, um, I eros my wife, or something like that, I don't know, I mean, um, I'm sure I'm getting all the, you know, the declensions and conjugations wrong in the Greek, but, um, but, I, it, I think it's helpful. I just don't see a whole lot of evidence of it from the 60s. It may have been there, but I just haven't come upon it yet. So. Let's thank Brad for being here with us tonight. Uh, we did offer a class in biblical sexuality about five or six years ago, um, but there weren't this many people here for it. Okay. Next week, we close off the Linton Lecture Series. Jim Edwards, formerly of First Press, formerly of Whitworth, now University, will be speaking on love in the letters of John, and it is a perfect conclusion to our lecture series and support for our sermon series, especially as we will then be going in uh, the next week into Holy Week. Uh, please keep checking the schedule of events here at the church. You don't want to miss uh, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, as well as uh, Easter. And I think Marlene can still use volunteers to help out with greeting people so that the folks who come here on Easter will have a real experience of resurrection life that comes out of the deep, deep love of God in Christ. So uh, have a blessed and warm evening. Thank you for being here.